Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. This one's all about the USS Nautilus. It's the first nuclear-powered submarine. You already knew that because you read the title. Let's just jump in. But before we do, this video is brought to you by Surfshark. Safety and security online are critically important and you can protect yourself online with Surfshark. Yes, 83% off, three months for free. There is a link in the description below. If you'd been standing at the North Pole on the 3rd of August 1958, you would have been present when history was made. But as you gazed around, you'd be forgiven for wondering what all the fuss was about. Almost 50 years since humans had first trekked overland to the North Pole, it was now the turn for the first visit, not coming across the ice, but rather from underneath it. God, it's insane the progress has made. 50 years before the nuclear submarine, no one had been to the North Pole, ever wild. Below the North Pole that day sat the USS Nautilus, not only the first submarine and first sailing vessel of any kind for that matter to reach this spot, but also the world's first operational nuclear-powered submarine. We tend to hurl the word trailblazer around these days, especially on this channel, but the USS Nautilus, I promise you, it was exactly that. It was a piece of engineering that completely redefined naval warfare. With the Cold War now in full swing, this submarine inched the United States ahead of the Soviet Union in terms of submarine technology, and combined with the emergence of ballistic missiles, the USS Nautilus was a vessel that set off an era of deadly nuclear-powered submarines prowling through the oceans, capable of destroying large portions of the planet in an instant. Submarines had come to the fore during World War I, particularly in the Atlantic. German U-boats had caused catastrophic damage to the British and American merchant fleets, and while the threat of U-boats eventually diminished, in part thanks to the deciphering of the German Enigma codes, their legacy remained long after the fighting ended. The US had used several different submarines during the war. The Gato class was the first mass-produced American submarine, and 77 were built between 1941 and 1944. They were improved upon by the Balao class submarine, of which 120 appeared between 1942 and 1946. The final class of submarine to fight in World War II was the Tench class, which were larger, stronger, and had a better layout than their younger siblings. While 29 of them were completed, 51 were cancelled as it became clear that, with Japan now on the ropes, a vast armada of submarines was just no longer needed. As war became peace, the need for such enormous armies and navies disappeared. But five years after the culmination of the largest bloodbath in all of history, the United States was now eyeing a very different type of enemy. The Soviet Union was positioning itself as the natural competitor to the United States, and its first atomic detonation in 1949 showed the Americans that the Soviets were really rather hot on their heels, as we discussed before on, I believe, this channel or maybe another channel, Side Projects, which you should absolutely subscribe to. The Soviets got their nuclear bomb way faster than the Americans expected, possibly, likely due to spying. While a massive military buildup in terms of physical numbers wouldn't happen again, the arms race was just getting started. Traditional diesel submarines needed to surface every day for a few hours to charge their batteries, a fact that made them highly vulnerable when on the surface. Even after the introduction of submarine snorkels, the problem was not fully addressed, because now while the submarines could remain underwater, its speed was limited and compartments inside typically saw an unhealthy buildup of CO2. So design work began on what would be the world's first nuclear submarine in March 1950, but it wasn't until July 1951 that Congress officially authorized the construction of the vessel. At that point, she was known simply as SSN-571, but by the end of 1951, she had a new name. The name Nautilus comes from Jules Verne's classic 1872 book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It's a story about a feared underwater monster that, in fact, turns out to be a cutting-edge submarine. It seemed like an appropriate choice, and actually the third time the US Navy had used it. Her keel was laid down by President Harry S. Truman on the 14th of June 1952 at the Electric Boat Shipyard in Groton, Connecticut. She was first launched a year and a half later on the 21st of January 1954, and finally commissioned on the 30th of September 1954 under the command of Commander Eugene P. Wilkinson.
The USS Nautilus measured 98 meters in length and had a beam of 8.5 meters. She had a submerged displacement of 4,092 tons, which was pretty big at the time. But just to give you an idea of just how big things got from here on out, the Soviet Typhoon-class submarines, which began appearing in the early 1980s, had a displacement of nearly 12 times that of the USS Nautilus. We've actually already covered the typhoon here on Mega Projects. In fact, it was one of the most popular videos we've ever done. So if you're looking for a deep dive on Cold War submarines, why not give that a watch after? Deep dive. Ah, <laughs> The Nautilus was powered by a submarine thermal reactor, later redesignated as the S2W, a pressurized water reactor built by Westinghouse Electric Corporation. The shell around the reactor alone weighed 35 tons, while all of the biological protection put in place, including lead, steel, and other materials layers, added up to around 740 tons. It came with an installed power of 13,400 horsepower and a top speed of the submarine of 23 knots, which is about 43 kilometers an hour or 26 miles per hour. As would be almost universal in the coming years and decades, the Nautilus's nuclear reactor lay almost exactly in the middle of the submarine. Directly behind it was the engine room, with the aftercruise quarters located in the stern of the submarine. If you move forward from the reactor, we've got the control room, bridge, attack center, and periscope room. Further forward is the galley storerooms, the captain's stateroom, the officer's wardroom, and the rest of the crew's quarters. Located in the bow of the submarine is, of course, the torpedo room with six torpedo tubes standing by. The crew was composed of 13 officers and 92 enlisted men. Now we'll find out a little more about what the Nautilus did in just a moment, but first, a word from today's video sponsor, Surfshark. Do you use the internet? Well, yeah, of course you do. Look, you're using it right now. Do you have personal information that you'd rather remain personal? Well, who doesn't? Unfortunately, the internet is all kinds of weird. There are people out there who want to ruin your day, take your details, steal your identity. Thankfully, Surfshark users have the protection of Hacklock. This searches database for your password, which sounds like a bad thing, but no, Surfshark are the good guys. They find it, they let you know, then you change the password and boom, you're nice and safe. And once you're back in that warm comfort and safety, maybe you're like, mm, let's watch some Netflix. Let's chill out. But what's that? The show you want to watch is only available in the UK and you live in Miami? Well, don't worry. Just fire up Surfshark hit up that VPN, and boom, before you know it, you're over in London, or at least your Netflix thinks so, and you're watching whatever you like. And also, Surfshark is totally unlimited, so if you want to watch in 4K, you can absolutely do that. You don't have to worry about bandwidth. Also, they've got great support and a 30-day money-back guarantee if you're not happy. Get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below, or just use my code MEGA. And let's get back to the Nautilus. Occasionally, real life throws up some real zingers that any Hollywood scriptwriter would have been proud of, and so was the case on the 17th of January 1955. The historic words, underway on nuclear power, said by Commander Eugene P. Wilkinson shortly before the USS Nautilus left port for the first time, have gone down in naval folklore, and understandably so. For the first time in history, a naval vessel was venturing out at sea using nuclear power. A few months later, she set a course once again, this time for her shakedown testing period, and records immediately started tumbling in her wake. The journey of 1,200 nautical miles between New London and San Juan, Puerto Rico, was completed fully submerged throughout and in less than 90 hours. This immediately became the longest submerged cruise by a submarine, and at the fastest sustained speed for one hour or more ever seen. Over the next few years, the submarine clocked up mileage like there was no tomorrow, and by early 1957, she had reached 60,000 nautical miles, that's around 110,000 kilometers, or 69,000 regular miles. For the keen Jules Verne fans out there, you might recognize that number as what the fictional Nautilus had achieved in the early stages of the book. Later that year, the USS Nautilus took part in NATO exercises for the first time and made stops in Britain and France, where American allies were treated to a tour of this next-generation submarine. But in October 1957, the United States and her NATO friends were not so much interested in what was in the ocean, rather they were interested in what was in the sky. When Sputnik 1 began signaling back to Earth as it orbited our planet on the 4th of October 1957, it sparked a series of events that would change both the space race and the arms race. With the Soviet-made object now passing freely and directly above the United States, it provided a new layer of fear and suspicion. The Americans were, of course, well advanced in their rocketry program, but they had been beaten to the punch in the coming years that US would overtake the Soviet Union in the space race. But in terms of arms, 
it remained neck and neck. Towards the end of the 1950s, both nations were nearing another nuclear milestone. The submarine launched Ballistic Missile, or SLBM, which would completely change the landscape of any potential nuclear war between the two sides. Once both nations had nuclear-powered submarines armed with SLBMs, the notion of trying to knock out a country's nuclear capacity in a preemptive strike just became impossible. By spreading the nuclear weapons around the world, both countries made sure they would have plenty in reserve if any strike came. But we're still not quite at that point in our story just yet. The first American operational ballistic missile submarine, SSBN, was the USS George Washington, which was commissioned in 1959 and commenced its first nuclear deterrent patrol in November 1960. Before that, however, US President Dwight Eisenhower wanted to test the feasibility of a polar transit that might garner support for the SLBM program, as well as providing something of a prestige boost after the demoralizing news regarding Sputnik 1. By this point, the USS Nautilus was under the command of Commander William R. Anderson, and on the 25th of April 1958, she began traveling along the California coast. The submarine stopped first at San Diego, then San Francisco, and finally Seattle. After final preparations, the USS Nautilus began her historic trip on the 9th of June, but alas, it was not meant to be. Ten days after leaving Seattle, the submarine entered the Chukchi Sea, but was almost immediately turned back by deep drift ice in relatively shallow water. The crew on board the Nautilus would have to be patient, but nearly a month in Hawaii probably helped. After retreating from the ice, the Nautilus sailed to Pearl Harbor and remained there until the 23rd of July 1958, when once again she headed north. On August 1st, 1958, the Nautilus disappeared below the waves and into the Barrow Sea Valley off the coast of Alaska. On board the submarine was the special gyro company built by Sperry Rands that had been installed specifically for this trip. Normally, gyro compasses become inaccurate above 85 degrees north, and there was a real danger that the submarine might lose its way beneath the ice. Apparently, Commander Anderson had simply planned to blast through the ice with torpedoes if it came to that, which I suppose is one way to do it. Another gadget that greatly aided the groundbreaking trip was the North American Aviation N6A1 Inertial Navigation System INS, a modification of what has been used on the Navajo cruise missile and had recently been successfully trialed. The INS uses a combination of instruments, including a computer, motion sensors, and gyroscopes to continuously calculate the position, orientation, and speed of the submarine without relying on external references. Shortly before midnight on August 3, 1958, the USS Nautilus became the first naval vessel ever to reach the North Pole. The crew on board were no doubt electrified by Commander Anderson's words, for the world, our country, and the Navy, the North Pole. Over the next 20 years, the USS Nautilus crisscrossed the globe, and in May 1966, she logged her 300,000th nautical mile, that's 560,000 kilometers or 350,000 miles. As with much of what goes on behind the veil of military secrecy, we don't know that much about the rest of the distinguished boat's career. What we do know is that she took part in the naval blockade of Cuba in 1962, as well as several NATO exercises, both in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. In November 1966, she collided with the aircraft carrier USS Essex, but the damage was minimal and after a brief period resting up while being repaired, she ventured out into the open seas once again. As groundbreaking as the USS Nautilus was in 1954, time stands by for nobody. Towards the end of its naval life, the submarine showed its age badly. Vibrations within a hull had become so loud that sonar was effectively useless at speeds above four knots. She may have been a pioneering submarine, but the US Navy also learned a lot from what not to do from the USS Nautilus. On the 9th of April 1979, the submarine began its final journey from Groton, Connecticut to the Mare Island Naval Shipyard of Vallejo, California, where she would be decommissioned. Her final day at sea was the 26th of May 1979, and she was officially removed from the Naval Vessel Register on the 3rd of March 1980. But that's not the end of our story. In 1982, the USS Nautilus was designated as a National Historic Landmark, and the following year it became the official state ship of Connecticut. After extensive renovations, she was towed back to Groton, and on the 11th of April 1986, the Nautilus opened its doors, or hatches, we should probably say, to the general public as part of the Submarine Force Library and Museum. As she approaches her 70th birthday, the USS Nautilus now welcomes roughly a quarter of a million visitors every single year. It might be a far cry from its next generation birth and its humming nuclear reactor, but this old submarine certainly cemented its place in naval history. 
So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Surfshark. And look, if you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, please do use the comments below. And thank you for watching.